Welcome to Dub Nation, the official show of the Utah Warriors of Major League Rugby. I am Jeremy Jordan alongside Banksy. We both survived Snowmageddon here in Utah. It's been crazy today. Still snowed into my house. There's over four and a half feet, I think, and counting. Jeez! Most of that blowing in sideways, but <laughs> Granted, you live like up on a hill, uh, way high where it's crazy. Man, that is nuts. Uh, we hope it clears out before Saturday because we have what's called a outdoor rugby match uh to be at and to call with dallas so we'll keep an eye on that we're on the utah Warriors facebook twitter and youtube accounts subscribe to the podcast version on apple Podcasts, spotify and soundcloud listen to the show we broadcast weekly on espn 700 in salt lake city look at the uh freshly shorn angus mcclellan looking like six years younger how about that i love okay, it here's what's on the show today he's he's looking good he's looking good we'll recap the san diego game we'll preview the home opener with dallas coming up saturday afternoon Round one MLR recap, round two preview around the league. Plus, we'll talk with Caleb Makane, the fullback, and uh, Yuri Van Vuren uh, among the uh, forward pack there. Okay, round one in San Diego at Snapdragon Stadium, the new home of the Legion, San Diego State football. An MLR record crowd showed up for this one, which is pretty cool, uh, but not cool. A 33-17 loss to the Legion. What were your general thoughts on round one for the Warriors? I thought it, you know, sometimes the saying is win ugly. And I think that's really what San Diego did. I didn't see anything really all that impressive from either side. It was a lot of really unstructured rugby, a lot of whistleblowing. And in the end, it was just San Diego able to punish Utah for their own mistakes. Not really doing anything spectacular on their own. They gave them the edge in that match. Yeah, it's a record crowd. It's a week one. It's San Diego, who's really had Utah's number, unfortunately, over the years, which we'll get to in a second. And, uh, you know, you shake off the rest, uh, you lose game one, you move on and hope, hope you win a home game against Dallas, and then you keep going from there. So let's go to the highlights, or in uh, some cases the lowlights, 16th minute, Bacaosi, Pifaletti, the uh, loose head prop, scores a try after a spell of playing the 22 from the Legion. Conversion was good, 7 nothing San Diego. And this was the first real and structured phase play from either team in this game. I mean, that tells you in the 16th minute, it took that long for both of these teams to settle down. And it was just great phase play and a a good inside ball to Pifaletti that ended up scoring it. One minute later, uh, the Warriors respond. It was great. Uh, Legion kick out of the 22 on the restart. Warriors score quickly in the 17th minute, thanks to a great offload from Saya Uhila to Joe Mono, who all he does is score tries. Well, and if you look at the replay there, the initial kick from Mana wasn't great as he tried to grub her through, actually came off the outside of the foot, took a bounce, came off of a San Diego player, and then Saya Uhila just running support, storms onto it, Chief with the big one-arm offload, and Joe Mano just never stopped running the outside line, and he's able to dot it down right on the head of a braided former Utah Warrior. That would be Mikey Tail. Uh, eight tries in the last eight games by Joe Mono. Just incredible clip there. He, he's he's uh, I I don't know this exactly, but I would guess his in the last eight games he is the highest scoring player in MLR at that rate. Conversion no good. Seven five Legion. Twentieth minute. Sayo Hilo was given a yellow card for a late tackle with no arms, so it's fifteen on fourteen for a spell. Uh, one minute later, um, you know, four minutes after the previous try, Dan Pryor, the former Maori All Black, dots it down. 12-5 for San Diego, conversion no good. And at this point, Utah playing from behind still, but uh, prior dotted it down to go up seven. You know, still in it, still competitive. Both of these teams have a lot of errors going at this point. You know, the, the yellow card was actually called down from upstairs by a referee who shall not be named. And uh, when you look at the replay, clearly it should have been a penalty for contact. I don't know that it should have been a yellow card at that point. It wasn't cynical. You know, he didn't lay the guy out. Uh, You know, there may have been a little grandstanding there. Definitely a penalty. I don't think it was worth a yellow card. But as you progress through this half, the absence of the physical presence of Saya Uhila clearly lost by the Utah Warriors. Uh, Just a couple minutes later, Utah gets to within one meter after a line out. Good platform to attack from. Unfortunately, didn't punch it in. Uh, Held up a 22 meter drop and then kind of reset. But another minute later, another line out of five meters. Line out was turned over. So there were opportunities to tie this game. Unfortunately, it didn't go the Warriors way right there. These are some of those errors that plagued this team in the early part of last year as well. You know, inside of five meters, inside of 10 meters, the ability to play with that desire to drive towards the line, but the patience to allow it to develop in front of you, I really felt was missing by this team. 
They had a really good shove on in both of these opportunities and really had three opportunities as they reset on the one that they could have scored. And I think just a little bit more patience and one more movement off the back and they would have driven through pretty clearly rather than forcing the issue when the opposition still had a chance to respond. Two minutes later inside the 22, uh, there was a knock on. Otherwise, that would have been a scoring set of phases as well. To the 30th minute we go, uh, Andrew Henderson made a penalty kick. It's 15-5 Legion. 32nd minute, Nate Oxberger, the USA Eagle, sometimes scrum half uh, in this game, winger, uh, scored after an assist from all-black legend Maunonu, uh, and uh, San Diego tacks it on some more. This was really when things started to click for San Diego, and it was Maunonu really playing almost like like an old school pivot role standing really close to Henderson, their, their uh, fly half, and kind of just being a ball distributor. He got the break on this particular play, found a bit of space on the outside going to the left, and Oxberger with the speed to be able to finish it on the outside. So it's 20 to 5 at halftime. Game winning scores already happened, unfortunately, at this point. 49th minute, Josh Henderson makes a, a pen- another penalty goal, gives the Legion a 23 5 lead, but 53 minute. Uh, the second try of the season goes to Paul Lasique between the posts for seven. He just took matters into his own hands, takes the ball uh, out of the ruck and just dots it down. And this is one of those just heads up plays where your leadership knew they had to get something going and he saw a key moment and took advantage of it. So a veteran moment there from Paul Lasique being aware of where the defense was and where the try line was to be able to go right over the top of the action and score it. A reminder, Paul didn't join the Warriors till later in the season last year, so early, healthy Paul Lasique is certainly going to make a difference this season for Utah. 23-12 at this point, 57th minute, Christian Poitavin, the former L.A. Giltini off the bench, dots one down, it's 28-12, conversion no good. 67th minute, Utah responds with a Caleb Makany try to cut it to 30-17. to And Caleb had a great game playing from the fullback position. He got moved all around the field later in the match. I thought he was really probably the only consistent and steadying influence in that back line where everybody else felt kind of frantic and uh, and and out of character, I really feel, for this team. But Caleb had a great match and well-deserved on that score to be able to finish it. First game, record crowd. There's kind of a lot going into this one, I suppose. Uh, six minutes later, San Diego's Will Hooley, who uh, is former USA flight half, he made a penalty goal for three more, and that is the final 33-17. to 17. Here's some of the stats from the game. Tries four to three, so San Diego gets that bonus point, the five-pointer. Uh, Utah didn't make a conversion in this one, unfortunately. Uh, let several of those tries in the corners. Um, we've seen Joel Hodgson nail those, though. I'm, I'm sure he's going to soon. Uh, tackles San Diego plus seven in that department. A lot of lineouts for both teams. Pretty successful, although not straight a couple of times. And uh, Utah had a tough time inside uh, the 22 at times. Scrums, pretty good for Utah there, seven of eight, and then uh, almost equal in penalties. Well, when you look at these stats and realize how close this game was statistically, San Diego played a lot more rugby inside the Utah half, but barring a couple of mistakes from the Utah Warriors, we're talking about a completely different outcome in this game. So they've been training indoors due to the weather here in Utah, had a really tough road trip on the training camp. Hopefully this is the shake off the dust and cobwebs. You know the standard now that you have to play at. They need to come out firing for week two and remedy some of these mental mistakes that plagued this team all throughout that game in San Diego. Man of the match, as voted by the fans, was Paul Asike. Had a try in this uh, game, 44 meters run, played 62 minutes. Good to see Paul out there early and often for Utah, and certainly he's got a lot more in the tank. I think it was a great hit out for Paul, um, you know, uh, and a lot more still to come. You know, if this team can settle in to some consistent phase play, which they never really had almost at any point in this game, like I said, very frantic and a frenetic pace that they tried to play at. They need to remember, you don't need to try and score on every phase, six, seven, eight phases really opens things up, especially for a player like Paul Lasique and his physicality and the weapons that he has outside and around him. So uh, clearly something that they'll work on in the buildup to this Dallas home opener. All right. MLR crowd of 11,423 starts our game notes in this one. 16 point loss, super rare. Fourth largest loss in team history, largest San Diego. Utah doesn't lose by, you know, three scores like this very often. Uh, Utah now one in seven versus the Legion all time. Certainly uh, look to improve that number later in the season when San Diego comes to Harriman and 31 plus allowed in seven of eight meetings for whatever reason. Legion score a lot against Utah and, and have typically won. Other notables, uh, we had the debut of Utah's white road kit. A lot of red in this match. 
Um, sometimes it's hard to see a little bit, but the white looks great for Utah. I love it. It was tough to see from the uh, from the observation point that we had because the white on the front looks great, but it's all red across the back of the kit, and I wish it was that white and gray across the back with the red accents across the shoulders to give it that extra contrast. I think it's great looking kit and outshines the rest of the league and what they're wearing. I just wish it was a little less red and I love the red. And it could always be, uh, you know, Boise state blue on blue. It could be worse. Um, well, and this is probably the only time that we'll actually have to wear this alternate kit because our regular home kit is actually the red with the black accents and the, and the away kit, excuse me, is the red with the black accents. The home kit is the black with the red and gray accents. So because of San Diego's home colors, we had to have this neutral alternate. There you go. Okay. It was fun to see it while it lasted. Uh, hooker Tuveri Vungakoto went with the orange hair coloring. That made him easier to spot. <laughs> uh, great stuff there from two. A little out of character for him, but good to see that he was a good sport. Probably a little late for training and uh, and had to pay the price <laughs> for that. Looking fresh, though, too. Love to see it, Boso. Yeah, he, he glowed. Uh, and four Warriors got their first caps. Uh, congratulations, Joe Hodgson, uh, Onehunga Havili, Jeremiah Noesi, and Connor McLeod. Great to see all four of those. I thought Onihunga was great on debut. He came in and was really a settling presence in that forward pack, playing a lot of time at eight with Yuri Van Buren moving into the second row and uh, really brought some physicality and structure and, and a calming presence. So I think his physicality is going to be a great asset. And then Noah Esse playing uh, in those early minutes as well was great for him. You see the long flowing hair from Jeremiah in the match really easy to spot where he's at on the field so congratulations to all four of them on their debuts for those new to rugby you know uh you, you call an appearance if you get in the game a, a cap when it's your first a big deal um that's a locker room tradition uh that happened after the game the only thing i wish those guys would do is wear that like during the week one regular day like to the grocery store um <laughs> other than that no it's it's a kind of old school looking cap and it's a cool tradition that uh, rugby has that you, you physically get a cap. It's a really great thing. And that's why it is. So the tradition I think goes back to 1908 and they would embroider the actual date and, uh, and opponent into the cap so that you have that as a keepsake forever to remember that milestone. Very cool. Okay. That recaps the San Diego game. Let's tell you what happened around major league rugby. Uh, rugby ATL started the season off with a 17, 10, win over Toronto in the first match of the season Friday night. They call it the Fire and Ice Cup. We don't ask questions. We just uh, nod our head. The Rattlers never trailed in that one. Also, Friday, New England went down to Noah Gold and won 36-12 for a bonus point uh, dominating victory, kind of picking up where they left off last year. They were spectacular in the regular season. Uh, did not uh, make it out of the semifinals Se uh, or the Eastern Conference uh, Championship, rather. Saturday, Old Glory DC took down the LA Austin All-Star squad of Chicago, 42-27. The game-winning score came in the first half from the boys from our nation's capital. I was a bit surprised by that one. I'll get your take in a sec. In a rematch of the MLR final, perhaps, perhaps the matchup of the week, Seattle beat New York 25-11. Seattle kind of sent in a shot across the bow of the league there with that one. Then Houston beat Dallas 33-12 in Choctaw Stadium in Arlington to finish round one. What did you think of week one in Major League Rugby? I think now you've got to look at the powerhouses, the traditional powerhouses out of the East and West staking their claim on MLR 2023. Everybody's watching Seattle. Everybody's watching San Diego out of the West. In the East, there it is. Rugby ATL, New England, and of course, New York staking their claim at the top of the table. I think those three teams uh, are, are going to be putting in big, big, big statements throughout the season and fighting for that top spot on the table in that first week by in the playoffs. Were you surprised Chicago, whose roster is just chuck full of talent uh, from LA and Austin and others? Were you surprised? I'm not surprised because I think they're going through some of the same things this Warriors team is going through. There's a lot of new faces in key places. Obviously, they're an entirely new franchise there. But with the additions of McLeod and Hodgson for the Warriors in those key playmaking spots, there's going to be some adjustment that's going to have to take place. There's a very steep learning curve in MLR that they're going to have to adjust to because there's no off weeks. I mean, you saw a pretty decent Dallas Jackals team who had some pretty legitimate sustained face play and at times looked really dangerous. So the Warriors are going to have to be ready as Dallas come to town this weekend at Zions Bank Stadium. There's no easy weeks in a major league rugby. Absolutely. Dallas is improved, um, you know, and, and both teams are looking for a win. We'll break down that game coming up later. Here are the standings 
the table, if you will. Uh, Houston and San Diego with five pointers. Again, you get four points for a win, one point if you score four or more tries. Uh, Seattle with a four-pointer there. Chicago, uh, Utah, and Dallas looking for their first points. In the Eastern Conference, New England and Old Glory DC with five points apiece. Rugby ATL with four. Toronto got a bonus point by losing within seven. That's how this works with the points. And then New York and NOLA with zero. So any surprises in week one in terms of uh, points so far? I don't think any real surprises. You know, it's not until we get into week six, seven, eight that you can start to see with any consistency who's playing at what level. So tough to draw any assumptions this early in the season. The assumption is there are none. Uh, The schedule for (laughs) round two looks like this. Seattle hosting rugby ATL. That's a big time matchup. Feels like potential playoff kind of matchup. Uh, West versus East in that one. Utah, of course, hosting Dallas. We'll break that down in a moment. Houston hosting NOLA, a battle of yellow and gold. New York versus Toronto. And then San Diego and New England. Uh, What's your game of the week here besides Utah, Dallas? Uh, As I look down the list there, obviously the Seattle versus rugby ATL game going to be a big matchup. I would give Seattle the edge in that because they're playing in Washington. That's a long way to fly, travel, and prepare if you're rugby ATL. The other game that I really would like to see are the Free Jacks, you know, the regular season champions. They finished the season with the best record in the East. Going down to Snapdragon Stadium in San Diego to play that physical San Diego Legion team that we just saw, that's one that I will be watching very closely. Yeah, amen to that. It's the first and last games um, in, in Seattle and rugby ATL, ATL's new green scheme. That's going to be fun. And then San Diego, uh, New England, that feels like uh, that's a big time matchup as well. So that rounds out round two matchups coming up this week in Major League Rugby. Well, and we talked about it. Dallas Jackals coming to Zions Bank Stadium for the best home field advantage in Major League Rugby. This is your chance to get in the red and black dub nation and be in the stands for a rare February game as your utah warriors take the field go to warriorsrugby.com and book your tickets now this is the home opener don't miss out be in the stands rocking the red and black and ready to cheer on your warriors go to warriorsrugby.com and get your single game tickets for the home opener coming up this weekend for the dallas jackals we got a high of 45 uh scheduled for saturday so it's not snowmageddon uh on saturday so come join us won't you saturday afternoon it'll be good let's go we now welcome to the program The fullback, sometimes fly half all the way from New Zealand. He's got some of the best lettuce on the team. He's got the white scrum cap. It's easy to uh, find him. His name is Caleb Mockany, as we welcome Caleb to Dub Nation. Caleb, how's it going, man? What's going on? Yeah, going good, boys. Um, Obviously snowed in today, so just a cruisy day at home with um, the fiancé. Not doing too much, but going good otherwise. Very nice. Have you experienced this amount of snow before in your life? No, not at all. We didn't uh, even get close to this last year. Um, thought I was going to be coming back over into a mellow, another mellow winter, but got in a bit of a shock. But it's all good fun. Eh? We, we love going out. We were out in the snow this morning getting some groceries, so it's all good. So your first initial reactions and takeaways from a game that mattered with the 2023 squad. How are you feeling after San Diego? Um, yeah, obviously, I was pretty disappointed. We, we felt like we had such a good preseason. Um, really good build up. So to go down and kind of feel like I said after the game, we didn't really get to fire too many shots. Um, didn't really feel like we got to test what we prepared in, in pre season. Um, had good tactics, had a good game plan, but yeah, at the end of the day, just felt like we didn't really fire. So obviously, boys were pretty disappointed um, after that, which is, I think, a good thing. Shows that everyone really cares this year. Um, so we're, yeah, we're excited for the weekend to hopefully really get to test that game against Dallas. You did score in this uh, match. Walk us through your try. Yeah, no, that was uh, one of the more easy ones. The boys did all the hard work. Um, Jolie, obviously, with some lovely hands under pressure. And then Cliven, as you know, the, the lovely hands as well, fixed the last minute. So I was just walking over. I think a um, bit of credit to the forwards on that one too with the scrum dominance. So just finishing off a team try there, eh? So... Where do you see the biggest room for improvement in this squad as we look ahead to the home opener? Obviously, you know the electricity that that Zions Bank Stadium and these fans can bring to you boys as you're on the field. What's the one big thing where you can circle and say, yep, that's where we need to be better? Yeah, so obviously from the weekend, um, our big thing is just 
the point of contact. I think we kind of we missed that on the weekend. We were riding tackles, weren't chopping. Um, obviously, we, we pride ourselves on our physicality, but we're just um, challenging the boys to be accurate with that physicality this week. We think uh, if we can be accurate with our physicality, um, we're really confident in our defence. So we want to get that um, big work on for this week is get that chop tackle in and then be able to yeah, really, really trust our D that way. Um, I think that'll give us a lot of help. And then just um, in terms of being able to test our game, um, having all the boys really clear on their details so we can nail our set-piece strikes. What uh, what did San Diego do, or, or maybe wasn't executed from the Utah standpoint, to try and get that kind of open, free-flowing game that we, we've seen this team is capable of? Yeah, I mean, I think you saw a few of the experienced boys, Isaac Ross and co., really challenge our line out, disrupt that clean ball. So um, we, we weren't striking off clean ball, um, and I don't think we adapted very well. So we obviously had a lot of slow ball, weren't able to get into the game, um, made a lot of mistakes, only converted three out of 10 opportunities in their 22, um, which is a, a pretty big thing. I mean, when you get into that 22, you really got to come away with points. Um, as we saw, that was a big work on for us last year. So again, we're just going to have that focus on um, being patient I'm um, really trying to nail that set piece platform so we can strike off this week. Um, that I think, yeah, that's kind of what it feels like. You had a great 50 22 in like the first 90 seconds of the match <laughs> for, for position and possession there. And it was, it was a great spot there, but then it felt like you guys really leaned on the boot as, is that just the way the game developed there? Or was, was there a conscious decision to try and tactically, use the boot back and forth with San Diego when it really felt like the urgency to play with the ball in hand is what was needed. Yeah, like I like you said, I think we did um, kick a, a kick a bit away. I think it felt like um, we didn't really have that, that platform to strike off. So we were trying to really back our D in this game. Um, we had a, a bit of tactics like that. And then I think you saw in the, in the second half, we probably overplayed a, a little bit because we felt like um, we hadn't had too much ball in hand. But... Um, yeah, I think a few, definitely a few tactical shifts from just us drivers this week, yeah. How was the crowd? MLR record, uh, you know, 11,000 there. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was pretty awesome. Yeah, love the new stadium. Um, like I said, we were really excited to play over there. That's why it's, it's pretty gathering not to um, really get to test our attack, I felt like. But the crowd was awesome. Um, obviously, such a good thing for the MLR to have, you know, 10,000 10, people. Like, that's, that's what we're getting the crowd back home, so... Um, definitely love the atmosphere, um, but looking forward to the crowd this week at home in Utah. I can't be the Utah crowd. Couple of familiar faces uh, on the opposing team there, uh, including your opposite number in the match with Mikey and Sama. Was there any banter going back and forth? Could you feel that you know they wanted it a little more one way or the other? Obviously, in the preseason match, things got a bit chippy with some of those guys. Yeah, um, nah, there was there was actually no banter in this game. I think. Um, both teams kind of really wanted this one, so it was it was a pretty quiet. And obviously, the game hung in the balance, so I think it was um, pretty quiet from both ends. Mikey and Summer both obviously had um, really great games, so yeah. And then for me, it's always trying to let the score do the talking, so um, always just trying to be on the right end of that score rather than chatting. But no, nah, it's a good one. And then we'll have some familiar faces coming up this weekend as well. Uh, Danny Christensen, of course, Alex Tucci on the other side, James Fifale now, uh, Carson Shoemaker's there too. What will it be like and what is it like to compete against guys that you used to be on the same team with? For sure. I mean, it's yeah, same back home, um, compete against a bunch of really good mates pretty much every week in the Mitre 10 back home. So it's always fun. Um, always try, you usually catch up after the game and it's just, yeah, it's pretty much all go, all serious on the field. Um, try just, yeah, let the game do the talking. But um, like I said, after the game, love to love to catch up with all the boys and see mates. And at the end of the day, um, mates off the field, but on the field, um, business time, yeah. So last year in this game, uh, you and the boys put up a then record 69 points against this Dallas Jackals team. What are you looking for in this matchup again? And hopefully a repeat performance of a record-setting points run? Yeah. Um, I mean, Dallas look really strong, so we're, we're, we're definitely not taking them lightly at all. We're just trying to focus on um, ourselves this week. Like, like we said, we 
we weren't happy with our performance against San Diego. So we're not, not thinking too much about Dallas, not thinking too much about the score. We're just really chasing a performance that we can be proud of this week. And then that just looks like, um, yeah, putting in all the work during the week. So come weekend, we've, we've got nothing to worry about. We've just got full confidence and pretty much going out, having fun, putting on a performance for the crowd and putting on a performance that um, we can be proud of, really. So I think it's going to be a tough one, though. They look looking a lot stronger this year. They didn't win a match last year. Certainly had some uh, quality there as we chat with uh, Caleb Mockney. But this team seemed to, it seems improved. They have a lot of Argentine players. They have a, a new head coach. Um, and, and they're a team that feels like uh, they're improved. So what is it? And you mentioned, hey, we're worried about us right now. But what is it about Dallas that you feel like you need to be ready for? Um, I think physicality. Like um, you mentioned, they got got a, got a strong um, Argentinian influence in there. Um, they're always really good in the chop tackle, so we're yeah we've got to look to our variation on attack and um, on D. We just can't be riding tackles where we're going to have to just shut them down. Um, and the physicality, like I said, it's got to be accurate. It can't just can't just rely on um, loose physicality. We've really got to be accurate with that physicality battle this week. And so I think if we can win that up front, um, it plays in our favour a lot for putting the rest of the game together. One more quick message to the fans as we wrap it up here. Anything you want to say to Dub Nation as we get ready for the home opener? Uh, yep, for sure. I know it's going to be cold out there on Saturday, but looks like um, the sun might be showing its face. So we'd love for you guys to come down. Um, like I said, haven't had many crowds like the Utah crowd when we pack out that stadium. So, you know, we'd love for you guys to come down, get behind us for the home opener. Um, we can't do it without you guys. So hope to see you all out on the weekend. And yeah, cheers for having me on the show, guys. It's going to be fun. What's the coldest game you played in, by the way? Um, I think the coldest last year might have been, I can't remember, I had skin. Maybe it was a San Diego night game, but it, was, it wasn't below um, zero degrees. So looks like it might hopefully sneak up into three or five degrees in the weekend. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm seeing uh, mid 40s, which is really warm uh, this yeah. time of year. So we're going to get out of snow again and be all right. Caleb, we appreciate the time, man. Best, best of luck with everything. Cheers. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Okay, Caleb Mockney joining us on the program. I like what he talked about in terms of, obviously, on the field, what they need to improve on physicality. We're confident in our defense. The stat that really stuck out that he presented, 3 of 10 in the 22. Essentially the red zone of rugby, right, if you're talking football terms. You certainly need to be uh, converting at a higher clip than 3 out of 10. I, I would think you probably want to be in kind of the 6 out of 10 range. Or higher even than that, you know, because – at that point, those are just small mental mistakes in in crucial moments that end up coming to bite you in the butt long term on the scoreboard. You know, those are the key scoring opportunities you got to take advantage of. But really, the the poise and the posture and the maturity to say we're just going to worry about us and put on our best performance, regardless of who's on the opposite side of the field, I think is a real stamp on mentally where this team is. They know that they have a much better performance in them. And they've got to focus on controlling what they can, and then they'll be able to get on the trot and put on a show for these Warriors fans. Okay, as mentioned, next up, Utah versus Dallas. The Jackals coming to town Saturday, February 25th, to Mountain Time. TV is KMYU and AT&T Sportsnet. We will be on the call with Ashley on this one, streaming on kslsports.com and the Rugby Network Radio on ESPN 700. B92.1 and Cool FM 105.5. Basically, we're everywhere. Okay, some storylines into this one. Third meeting all time. Dallas was an expansion team last year. Uh, Utah won both of those games. And they were both record setting in different ways. The first one was a, a then MLR record 69 points at home. And then um, the, the record that uh, Utah tied was only five points allowed on June 4th, the regular season uh, finale, uh, the season finale. Back-to-back -back seasons opening at home versus Dallas. Uh, both teams lost last week. Dallas lost 33-12 to Houston, as we mentioned, so both looking for a win. Jackals did not win a game last year. I anticipate they're going to win several games this year. Um, and the Jackals have scored 14 or fewer in 10 straight games. There's certainly an opportunity to try and score some points and defensively keep them down as they still figure out the offense with a new-look group this year. Well, and I think both of those games from last year are really a reflection of what's possible with the team 
this year. We know that they can score points in buckets. They proved last year that they could do it, but they can also get it done on defense with what was then, you know, the, the lowest points allowed with the five uh, against this Dallas Jackals team. Again, a lot of new international influence for this Dallas team. This isn't the 2022 Dallas Jackals. This is a very strong, very structured team that is looking to find their form, just like the Warriors are. So advantage Warriors at home with this home crowd, and uh, and hopefully the boys can put on a show for Dub Nation. And they certainly dealt with, you know, uh, an off-the-pitch incident where, uh, you know, a walkway collapsed, and they had a lot of guys injured. They had to borrow guys on loan. Some Utah Warriors kind of backups uh, uh, went and participated, including, including Carson Shoemaker, who's now there permanently. Um, so, yeah, they, they battled a lot. They got a new general manager in Santiago Sodini, who came over from Rugby ATL. They got a new head coach in Agustin Cavalieri, former Argentine lock, uh, former Italian U-20 coach. So hence the Argentine influence, which brings us to players to watch. Uh, a couple of Juan Pablos in this one. Juan Pablo Zeiss, who is an MLR first 15 prop from Houston. He's really good. Juan Pablo Aguirre inside center. He's the captain. And then Adrian uh, Cata Elsie, MLR title game with Atlanta a couple of years ago. He's a fullback. He does the kicking. And if you look at the signings they've had in the offseason, too, I think eight or nine different Argentine nationals uh, for a total of 16, I believe, on the roster here, yeah. including those three. You add to that guys that we know can be weapons like our very own James Vifale, who thankfully landed himself an MLR roster spot. It'll be good to see the Uso out there. Hopefully, though, we can hang the L on him as he comes to town. Danny Christensen came up uh, in last week as the backup scrum half. Um, so yeah, we're, we're going to see several familiar faces, which is always good, uh, to see those guys. And, uh, they, they were great Utah Warriors. It'll be fun to see them in action again. That's this Saturday, uh, two mountain time. Make sure you're at the stadium. If, you can't, if you're not local and you can't make it, make sure you're watching or listening and, uh, check out the broadcast as we are excited about the home opener. Well, if you didn't play rugby, what sport would you play? The team was asked that question and here's what they said. Hey, hockey, man, because we have snow in Congo. <laughs> uh, water polo. Uh, if it wasn't for my knee, I'd be a badminton player. We do, uh, fishing. Oh, dude. I'd be in the NFL, though. Bowling, for sure. Bowling. For sure. <laughs> uh, baseball. Baseball, baseball, baseball. Golf. 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 Archery. <laughs> Soccer. Track and field. Golf. Uh, surfing. Definitely golf. Swimming. Swimming. I'll be on the dogs. Basketball, baby! Yeah! Uh, rugby all the way, man. <laughs> A lot of uh, scratch golfers uh, in there, apparently. Uh, I did love that uh, Paul Mullen with his Irish accent. Archery. <laughs> <laughs> I like the darts got an honorable mention in there as I well. The darts. I can see Look, Niall. Niall I'm with you, bud. I love darts. watching professional darts out of the UK and Europe. It is amazing. The crowds, the atmosphere to be a professional darts player. Oh, I would absolutely love that. Yeah, a little Ted Lasso, and then you you switch to the right hand at the last second. You know what I'm saying? Right, barbecue um, sauce, and then you know hit the hit yeah. the double out. Yeah, yeah. There's <laughs> a little Princess Bride there. There's just one problem. I'm not left handed. Um, yeah. <laughs> what's the answer for you, by the way? Because you you've played rugby throughout your life, but what what's kind of the second sport for you? Uh, the other the other game that I really loved was volleyball. Uh, I played that all my life alongside of rugby. I actually played rugby for a lot longer than I played volleyball. Um, but that was another love that I always had as a kid was uh, was as a volleyball player and playing beach volleyball would uh, would definitely be a dream come true. Hey, beach specifically. You? That's awesome. You got to have good hands for that. That's fantastic. What would you play? What's your answer? Basketball is my primary kind of sport that I would play. I think volleyball might have been second. Volleyball is fun, man. Yeah, it's definitely not hockey. I can't skate with crap. So, yeah, it's, it's not, it's all right, not well, that Let's put together a volleyball game uh, for, for all of these yeah. guys together so we, yeah. can, we can get in and do it. Um, I, I, 
I, I've been calling volleyball forever uh, at BYU. I only played really one year, but uh, I love it, man. It's a fun sport. Fun fact, my first kill playing volleyball in high school was against the legend himself, Ryan Millar. From oh! The, uh, U- the U.S. Olympic team. Gold and medalist. Course, BYU National Championships. Uh, wow. We were kids together back in, in Southern California. This was right before I moved to New Zealand. And, uh, and the first kill I ever got in a JV volleyball match was on Ryan Millar. And so, that was the last one he ever gave up. That was the, <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably pretty close to it. Uh, <laughs> look, if you want to get your kids involved in sport from an early age and create memories and create interactions that will last a lifetime, Junior Warriors Rugby Clinics are on pregame for every home match. Go to junior.warriorsrugby.com. We'll connect the state of Utah through rugby. There is incredible Junior Warriors programs coming up through Salt Lake County, headed by our very own Ashley Burge, who's doing an amazing job of engaging these kids in our community and getting the rugby ball in their hands. You get a T-shirt, you get tickets to the game, interaction with players and coaches, and a chance to throw the ball around pre-match. So go to junior.warriorsrugby.com and sign up for the Junior Warriors Clinics now. Okay, our second guest today is Yuri Van Vuren, uh, one of the powerful players on this team eight man he can play flanker he can he can do it all and he is uh from south africa and with the utah warriors again we welcome him back to the program um i i think you you described his hair perfectly earlier um uh, <laughs> go ahead and tell the people how you, how you would describe this amazing Yuri van uh, beaver oh. baby yuri van beaver welcome to the show yuri van beaver <laughs> i love it dude. how's it guys thanks for having me thanks for having me yeah it's good to see you, man. Um, I, I know we chatted when you when you got to uh, camp with the Warriors. You had a busy offseason, including playing in Israel, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a busy offseason joining Tel Aviv for the Rugby Europe Super Cup. So, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a busy time since we last spoke. When you and Niall Saunders both played over there in Israel as well, how was that experience in getting to play with a teammate? It was, it was a lot of fun, especially because obviously I had Niall Saunders over there with me. So it's nice to have familiar faces if you're in a new environment. But yeah, it was it was an awesome experience. I saw faces that I probably would have never seen had I not gone over there. And managed to play in the final for the first time in a couple of years. So that was, that's always good. How'd the final go? Unfortunately, things didn't go away. Um, but I mean, the experience is is what matters most for us, and um, who knows, might be back there sooner rather than later. Uh, hopefully an MLR final this year. <laughs> I'll do both. <laughs> yes, I love it. I like that attitude, Yuri. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously not the result the boys were looking for in San Diego. Your takeaways and reactions from that match? Yeah, it was a tough start to our season. Obviously, um, we had good preparations in the preseason, and it, I think things went pretty well um, leading up to the season opener in San Diego. So a lot to learn. Um, we're back in the lab this week preparing for Dallas and we can only learn from our mistakes and move forward from there. What do you feel like is easily correctable that we can see better this week? I think uh, we just need to recognize moments a bit better in the game, especially the momentum swinging ones and just be more clinical in our execution, especially at critical times critical places on the field. Um, but I don't think there's too much to be worried about this early on in the season. And it's all things we can fix real quickly. So everyone's still positive. The energy is still up. The energy is still good. So we're just looking forward for our home opener. So clearly more consistency is is what the team is looking for and being able to use our platform. As you look forward to Dallas uh, at home, what are you most excited for? Ah. Uh, can't really say the weather, <laughs> but it's going to be fun to be in front of our home crowd. Um, it's always good having the community come out and support the boys and also just playing against a few familiar faces. It's always good to catch up with the guys afterwards. Who on this team do you feel like is most prepared for like a weather game? Because we, we got dudes from, you know, Pacific Islands. We got South Africa. We got New Zealand. <laughs> Is it the Americans and like Paul Mullen and Niall Saunders who are like, yeah, if it rains or snows, whatever? Uh, I think the South Africans would be bottom on that list. Um, but if I had to pick <laughs> one, one player in particular, I think Emerson. Emerson definitely coming from Canada. Yes, Canada. He would have he would have he would have been growing up in this kind of weather. So Tim, it's probably just another day. 
He's like, this is a Tuesday. Just another Saturday <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> a bit of sunshine. What are you guys worried about, man? It's all good. <laughs> so what are you expecting to see out of this Dallas Jackals team? A lot of new international players here. This isn't going to be even close to the same level of team last year. A much improved squad. What are you expecting out of Dallas? Yeah, you hit the nail right on the head. It's obviously a brand new team. Um, a lot of um, Argentinian influence. I think the boys are looking good, or especially looking at them last weekend. It's like quite a powerhouse, especially up front when they back or forwards. So yeah, I think it's just the unknown for us that we have to deal with, and just go out there and focus on us, and just try and execute our own things better than we did this past weekend, and the results will go away. What do you expect from the first home crowd of, of Major League Rugby's leading attendance uh, uh, spot in Zions Bank Stadium in Harriman and Dub Nation? <laughs> oh, well, we're obviously going to be trying to fill up this um, Zions Bank Stadium as soon as possible. If we can do it from this weekend already, that'll be amazing. Um, I mean, if you look at San Diego, they did a pretty good job um, getting the attendance they did this past weekend even though for me, most of the time, everything was just a blur running between number four and number eight. So, but it's, it's good news to look at the numbers and how the league is growing. So we're just going to try and emulate that. You know, uh, we had Caleb on the show a little earlier and he said, you know, focus on us. I really feel like the quality of forward pack that we have the ability to put on the field for this Warriors team now can be pretty significant. You mentioned the strength of that forward pack in Dallas, when we've got the guys in the right place, and it seemed like in the last 20 minutes of that match with the addition of guys like Onihonga Havili coming in with Gus coming in and some of those guerrilla squad guys that we know are quality, that we can match up and outsize anybody and the rest of our game could build off of that. What are your thoughts on how our forward pack can and is performing? Uh, obviously, uh, we've, we've got a good scrummaging pack. If you look at all the packs in the league, I think we're right up there. Um, a few things we still need to work on, but we'll progress as the season goes. And yeah, I think I think we definitely, if you look at the forward packs and you compare everyone, we definitely afford to be reckoned with. Um, but I feel like all the teams are just getting better every year. So it's always a good challenge just measuring yourself against a, another pack, especially this weekend with Dallas. Seeing that they're a brand new pack, it's going to be interesting to see who gets the ascendancy. We're talking with Yuri Van Bieber. Uh, here on Dub Nation, um, what, on, on a day off, uh, Wednesdays are your day off. What What are you doing to relax and kind of? Uh, are you trying to get away from rugby for a day? Like, what What are you doing? Uh, well, I would try and stay off my feet as much as possible. Uh, I like going for just like a little relaxing, little run, maybe do three miles. Not trying to kill myself, but I mean, yeah, just anything that takes my mind off rugby a bit, just relax and prepare myself for the next day of training. All right, one last one here. Obviously, your strength and conditioning is a big deal and has been this year with Gibbo keeping you guys pretty honest. What's a good proper cheat meal look like for Yuri Van Buren on your off day? Can you repeat that, please? What's your cheat meal look like on your off day? Your chance to eat whatever <laughs> you want, get off of the, the meal program for a little bit, and you can just dive into whatever food you want. What's your guilty pleasure? Honestly, I, I can't. I don't think I have a specific one. I guess I just wake up and see what I feel like. But I'm not too big on the sweet treats. Uh, I mean, like today, I just figured I'd cook a meal. I um, haven't cooked in a while, so yeah, just doing a little crock pot since the weather's allowing it. So yeah, that's. I think that's why I enjoy doing most. Is now good follow up to that. Things. I heard there's a rumor that you guys are sharing pots and pans between some of the apartments for the boys who want to cook on any particular day. <laughs> Uh, that that's I can't I can't deny that. Um, luckily, we've got our own <laughs> we've got our own we've got our own setup, so uh, we're not sharing with anyone at least. So we're just trying to keep our own going and <laughs> eliminate any funny business. <laughs> You're like I need the medium pan for uh, some pasta. Right here. <laughs> I, please please give that back. No, uh, yeah, uh, he's Yuri Van Bieber. He doesn't share his uh, pots and pans. Uh, Thanks for joining us on the show, and we'll see you Saturday against Dallas. Thanks for having me, guys. Can't wait to see you out there. Yuri Van Buren from South Africa, uh, just a physical presence, one of the top three in the league. I believe he was second last year. And Rucker rivals, defensive Rucker rivals, he can move around the pitch. 
It's going to be fun to watch him and the boys coming up on uh, Saturday. And make sure you get your fresh 2023 merch, baby. Look, if you haven't seen some of the new team gear, make sure you get yours. Look at that looking fresh in the black, the red, and the white. The merch of the match will be a special set of uh, game day gloves that you can get. So make sure you go to shop.warriorsrugby.com for all of your 2023 Warriors merch needs and be ready to rock the four stripes in Zions Bank Stadium this weekend for the home opener as your Utah Warriors take on Dallas. Item of the game, gloves. Uh, Nola Gold uh, and Rugby ATL are not giving out any gloves. So these are special Utah Warriors items. options which is which is great Uh, baby you gotta have it you gotta have it well that'll do it for us like and share this episode of dub nation follow the utah warriors on social media our thanks to caleb mockany yuri van buren today's show was produced by mason uh, benson for banksy i'm jerem we'll see you saturday utah versus dallas go warriors